A warm welcome to everyone here. Uh, I'm Si Yang Shing, Director of Projects of Bini Singapore. Bini Singapore is a water engineering consultant active in Singapore for the past 100 years. I'm a council member of SWA, the Singapore Water Association. Our association represents 300 members who are active in the water market in Singapore. And you, if not yet a member, you can consider joining us. Today, I represent SWA to moderate this section on NRW reduction. NRW is a common problem every water utility faces. We all know how frustrating NRW is and how it affects the operational and financial aspects of utilities. Today, we have four professionals who have their respective experience in this subject matter. Each of them has 15 minutes to share with us his experience and knowledge. There's also a rapporteur, Ms. Shan Shan Wang, who is senior engineer of Arab Singapore. She's behind the scene, providing technical support to us and helping us make this section a success. So without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, Gary Wyatt. Gary is a senior consultant with our, uh, our utilities. She has worked, worked for many well-known water players, such as Bywater, Thames Water, Renhill, I2O, and Single Valves, and has extensive experience in water supply network modeling, operation, and pressure, and NRW management. Gary is the current secretary of the IWA Water Law Specialist Group, Let's tap into his wealth of knowledge in, in benchmarking leakage management. Uh, Gary, please. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And yes, I'll be speaking today about uh, leakage management uh, benchmarking, which is a um, program that IL Utilities undertakes and it's basically to evaluate uh, different utilities uh, as to how they are performing in terms of uh, managing non-revenue water, especially in their uh, maturity, but also benchmarking them across diff different utilities in their peer groups, so in the same country, the same size, but also uh, against other utilities in different countries and of different uh, maturities. We look at two main areas um, of NRW management. The first one being the non-revenue water uh, water balance, uh, which was developed by the IWA. And uh, this breaks down the non-revenue water into a number of different components. And the second area is actually the um, four pillars of leakage management. And you can see Leakage repairs, pressure management, and then pipeline asset management. We have got a number of utilities that uh, are already in the program. Uh, you can see the majority of them come from uh, Australia and from uh, the United Kingdom. We also have some utilities from Brazil, Italy, and uh, New Zealand. We're just about to start our third round of this um, benchmarking program. And uh, we have a few more utilities from the UK and also from Australia that are joining uh, this year. We're hoping to get a Asia group going as well so that we can have an Asia cohort of utilities and we can benchmark the leakage uh, management of those companies. Also with the program, we also have a workshop, a best practice workshop, which is held at the end of the program. And what's unique about this is it tends to be uh, utilities talking to utilities. So during the program, we identify the best practices undertaken uh, within each utility that we uh, review. And we get those utilities to actually present on what their best practices are. And 
Uh, we also produce a compendium of best practices as well, which will then be accessible to all of the participants, including contact details of people who they can uh, contact to get more information on those best practices. So let's have a look at the program insights. Um, when we start looking at the water balance, the IWA water balance, as I mentioned, it breaks down uh, the different components um, across non-revenue water. And there are a few components which are a bit of an estimate. And the IWA has actually created some assumption values. And you can see those down below. You can see the unbilled, unmetered, unauthorized uh, consumption, basically free water, and the IWA sets um, a figure of 0.5%. Then we have unauthorized consumption or theft, which is down at 0.1%. And then we have metering in inaccuracies of the customer meters, which is uh, given as 2%. Uh, you can see from the different utilities that we've got here, some actually use those assumptions that the IWA has set but other utilities have actually developed their own true figures or estimated what their uh, true figures are. Some of them are higher than the IWA assumptions and some are uh, lower. It's generally the UK utilities that um, have uh, estimated them themselves, and that's due to regulatory reporting. A case study in hand is actually Yorkshire Water, which you can see here, but uh, it relates to most of the uh, UK water utilities. Uh, in the UK, they have a regulator called Ofwat, and Ofwat requires that all of the companies have to quantify these components. They can't use the assumption figures, so they actually have to go out and quantify them. And this is where the utilities such as Yorkshire Water here is looking at free water, um, where they've maybe water at their own treatment plants or their own buildings is not billed, uh, or unbilled, unmetered consumption for things like firefighting, watering of gardens, uh, those sort of supplies. They're looking to try and estimate them a bit more accurately so that they can put in some uh, true figures into the uh, water balance. We also looked at real loss which is part of the four pillars. Um, you can see here we've actually broken down the Australian utilities, which are shown in orange, and the UK utilities, which are shown in green on the left. And you can see that most of the UK utilities have much higher real losses than the Australian utilities. This is a lot to do with uh, pipe replacement or asset management. The Australian utilities have a much younger um, pipe um, model, so they replace their pipes at a much younger age, whereas the uh, UK utilities tend to have their pipes lasting longer, and they just do uh, pipe uh, leak detection and repair to try and keep those assets lasting uh, longer than, um, than the Australian utilities. One interesting thing is we actually benchmark the leakage events, and you can see on the right here that we've broken it down into uh, transmission leaks, distribution leaks, and service connections. And one key thing that's got across all of the different utilities uh, within all the different countries is that the service connection leaks are much higher than the distribution uh, mains leaks. So. This is something that a lot of utilities have to recognize that service leaks on service connections is quite a major issue that needs to be uh, resolved. One such utility is uh, Unity Water in the Sunshine Coast in Australia. And they basically did a breakdown of their uh, real losses. And you can see it in the pie chart where their service connection leaks actually amounted to 56.3% of their leakage um, in, that they were reporting. And if you looked at it by volume, it was, it was um, still a significant um, volume as, as well. Uh, this actually led to Unity Water uh, coming out with a program to develop or replace their service pipes they 
they figured out that they were using the wrong type of PE pipe. They had been using PE50, then they moved to PE80, and they've now moving up to a PE100 to try and get uh, a longer life out of their uh, service connections. We also look at pressure management and also to do with um, PRV and DMA density. You can see the light blue in the bottom left is actually mainly the Australian utilities that don't have too many DMAs. They don't have too many PRVs, mainly because they don't have high leakage levels. So they, they don't think it's a big issue. Whereas the UK utilities, they've got a lot more DMAs um, and a lot more PRVs in place to do a, a high amount of uh, pressure management. And also, as you'll notice on the right here, the UK utilities do a lot more advanced pressure management in terms of putting uh, flow modulated controllers and timed controllers onto their PRVs to make their PRVs work um, a bit harder. One example is Thames Water. Uh, Thames Water basically is covers London and surrounding areas in, in the UK. And as you can imagine, London is quite a complicated system. They've got some very old pipes and lots of interconnected systems. So uh, they actually have some very complicated DMAs with multiple inlets to those DMAs. So they need quite a complicated uh, pressure management system that may have multiple PRVs controlling pressure into a single uh, DMA. So they actually have some closed loop systems that look at the critical point pressure in the DMA, and then they feed back to the PRVs to control them to manage the uh, pressure within each DMA. We also looked at active leak detection. Not surprisingly, because the Australian utilities have relatively low real losses, they actually do limited um, leak detection, active leak detection, and they rely mainly on their uh, customer reporting. You can see the reticulation, which is the middle one, that the Australian utilities, 90% of the leaks are actually come from customers uh, reporting. Whereas if we look at the UK utilities, you can see that it's 46% for the reticulation or distribution. And a lot more of their leaks come from routine inspection and acoustic uh, logging as well. An example of that is United Utilities in the UK. They basically have an extensive um, acoustic logging system across their network. They have over 46,000 acoustic loggers that are installed in their DMAs. And based on that, they've actually 24% of the leaks that are detected uh, actually come from these acoustic uh, loggers. It's not a cheap exercise to actually buy all of these loggers and then to manage them all as well. Um, but it's something that you, you are doing to actually um, try to get their leakage levels uh, down as low as possible. They are also looking at a number of other technologies, such as satellite technologies, and you can see here the sniffer dogs. Speed and quality of repairs was quite interesting as well. There was quite a distinct difference between the Australian utilities, which are in orange, and the utility UK utilities in green. Um, what happened at the beginning of this millennium, the early 2000s, there was quite a severe drought in Australia and water leakage became quite a public issue uh, with the public reporting leaks um, whenever they saw them, even if it was a very small leak. And the utilities basically brought in their millennium drought uh, repair criteria and they were repairing leaks within hours. Uh, sometimes within two to three hours of a leak being uh, reported. That drought has now passed um, and they, they're moving into a period where they have flooding or a lot of rain that's coming down. But the repair times, they're still managing to keep those very fast repair times. This compares to the UK, 
where there's actually it's it's actually a lot more difficult to get uh, approvals to actually dig in the roads from the local councils and governments. Uh, so it actually takes a lot longer for those um, repair times, which is which causes the leakage volumes to go up for each leak. An example here is City Westwater. Uh, which is in Melbourne in uh, Australia. And as I mentioned, during the millennium drought, um, 97 to 2009, they had they implemented very fast uh, repair um, uh, criteria where they had teams on alert, ready to go. They actually created a priority system so they knew which types of leaks were more um, severe than others and needed to be repaired faster. And they still keep that going now. Yeah, we also move into investment. Uh, you can see here that um, the we it's not really shown here, but actually the Australian utilities are spending a lot more in terms of uh, asset management, mains uh, renewal, uh, which we've already talked about, which is how their real losses are um, a lot uh, lower. Uh, compared to the UK utilities. And this is probably something that the UK utilities uh, learnt a lot from this program, was that they actually needed to uh, ramp up their investment and try to get more money from the off what through tariffs so that they could increase their um, investment uh, asset management renewals. Unity Water is actually one of the companies in Australia that uh, looked at um, their asset management planning as related to um, non-revenue water management. And they actually went out and did a um, got a consultant in to do a 10-year uh, system leakage management plan, which looked at nine different pillars. So rather than the four pillars of leakage management, they were looking at nine pillars of uh, leakage management, which you can see here on the right. And through that they developed a 10-year investment plan where they aim to bring down their non-revenue water down to their economic level of leakage. Uh, and they with that is actually quite low because they buy water from a third party at quite a high uh, price. So that was one of the reasons why they um, felt that this system leakage plan was something uh, critical. So that just gives you an overview of um, the leakage benchmarking program that we have done under IL. It's a program that's still ongoing and is open to all utilities. Um, uh, there is a fee for that uh, to cover the costs of IL running the program, uh, but we would be welcome to uh, talk to any utilities that are interested to learn a bit more about the program as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary, for sh sharing some insight, interesting insight given by our UK and Australian colleagues in managing NRW. Audience, if you have any questions, please post them uh, into the chat box. Uh, I'm sure Gary will be happy to answer whatever questions that you have to him. Our second speaker is Ashley Ng. Ashley started his career with Singapore's water agency, PUB, the Public Utilities Board, where he gained practical experience in water infrastructure operations. He joined Silent uh, about a year ago and has since quickly moved up the rank to be director of client solutions, driving the digital water business. Ashley, please share with us how uh, how you would use technology to reduce leakage in water distribution network uh, with an Asian case study. Ashley, please. Hi, hey, thank you, Mr. Sir. <clears throat> Hi, so my name is Ashley. I'm the Director of Client Solutions uh, for Xylem's uh, Decision Intelligence Solutions Unit. Uh, today, I'll be sharing with everyone uh, an Asian case study uh, where Xylem has employed our decision intelligence uh, solution uh, to help uh, our client to reduce leakages in their network. So without further ado, I'll start off with an overview. I will first uh, introduce the client to us. Um, for today's presentation, the client has been anonymized uh, for data security concerns. Uh, 
So I'll just share some details of uh, what the, the, the client's uh, profile is like so that we can uh, all have a, an appreciation of the size of the utility that we dealt with. Next, I'll move on to talk about the problem statement <clears throat> that was faced by the client before moving on to talk about our Xylem solution and how it helped the uh, utility to overcome their problems. And lastly, the outcomes that were achieved. So I'll start off with the client profile. Uh, the client is a Malaysian utility. It's a municipal water utility provider for a large Malaysian state. Some statistics below. The state that serves has uh, more than 3 million population and it operates more than 6,000 kilometers of water mains ranging from 300 millimeters to 2,200 millimeters in, si in diameter. The area of coverage for the utility is an area of around 8,000 kilometers squared, which leads to many of these pipelines uh, included in this uh, more than 6,000 kilometers of pipelines uh, <clears throat> running through very remote areas, which presents a problem for the utility, which I will share more on later. At the same time, the utility was facing high non-revenue water uh, in 2017 that came in at about 33%. So the problem statement that the utility was facing. The utility was using conventional methods, uh, manual methods, in fact, of identifying leaks and bursts. Uh, then what this resulted in, of course, is that leaks and bursts, uh, especially in those remote areas that I explained earlier, some of these times they can run uh, for quite a long time before they're discovered, uh, which results in a significant amount of water loss uh, through these leaks. The utility therefore desired a quicker response uh, to minimize leak runtime and also to minimize the disruption that would come from such leaks, especially if they grew bigger. The next point that the utility noticed was when they mapped out all their leaks, they realized that many of these leaks were occurring on the same pipelines. So they, they wanted greater oversight or greater sight, in fact, of the hydraulic network behavior in these pipelines so that they could perform a more robust root cause identification for these uh, uh, leaks and therefore implement uh, proper rectification measures that would prevent such leaks from occurring. The overarching objective for the utility was essentially to identify leaks earlier and more cost effectively. This was of course in comparison to the manual methods that they were deploying previously, where they had to go on site, where they had to walk pipelines and so on. They wanted to be able to direct their teams more effectively. They wanted to identify leaks earlier so as to reduce the leakage losses through these leaks and thereby reduce non-revenue water. The leaks that were recurring, the rectification that they wanted to implement, uh, a more permanent rectification, again, also result, would result in reducing non-revenue water. And lastly, because some of these leaks uh, eventually became massive bursts, uh, resulting in a significant public signature. The utility was also mindful of this effect and wanted to improve their public reputation by identifying and resolving leaks earlier before this event signature got too large. So this was, is in a essence, the overarching objective that the utility had. What solution did Xylem then provide to them? So Xylem solution was called water loss management, and it basically utilizes a mix of pressure transient monitoring and acoustic monitoring uh, to provide real-time monitoring for the utility. With this real-time monitoring, they were able to achieve 24 seven leak detection and alerting uh, augmented by our teams, and also to monitor pressure behavior, providing early warning to the utility of damaging pressure transients that are occurring within the pipeline so that they can take action to identify the root causes and mitigate these causes before the pipe actually failed. The program started in 2018 with the deployment of about 500 sensors. But since then over the years, this has grown to more than 1,600 sensors that have been deployed in the network. So some more details on how we are achieving these outcomes. The first is on leak detection. Our solution is a unique solution combining both pressure and acoustic monitoring to generate leak alerts. Um, the process for alerting is an automated one 
but it's also supervised by a team of analysts around the clock, providing reports to the client uh, to highlight to them uh, where the damaging sources of pressure transients could be, and also to highlight to them those uh, acoustic signatures which uh, combined with the pressure alerts uh, we created a high likelihood alert for, for leaks. This essentially helped the utilities to efficiently prioritize and to direct their ground crews so that they could respond in a timely fashion and address leaks as quickly as possible. At the same time, we also provided treasure transients analysis. Uh, this analysis helps uh, our client, the utility, to identify damaging transients and localize the potential sources. And thereby, once, identify, once the sources are identified, the utilities can then design interventions to help them to manage these transient magnitudes and reduce the stress on the pipeline. Some examples of this are on the right. Uh, you can see on the top right, we have an example of a pressure transient analysis uh, that was done. Uh, this is for illustration purposes. It was taken from a separate project, but essentially it, it is, uh, the analysis is something similar where we notice that the, you can see that there are very high magnitude pressures occurring at fixed times. And this typically is due to pump changeovers. This is just an example. There could be other kinds of potential sources. For example, uh, if client draw off is occurring at particular fixed time and this, these clients are big clients, then they could also generate pressure transients that would be uh, visible from our, from our solution. Identifying it, of course, is one, the first step. The next step would then be for the utility to work with the ground crews to design the respective interventions. At the bottom on the right, those two photos basically show our sensor uh, and RTU setup. The RTU is the radio transmitter unit. Uh, you can see on the left photo uh, where we have a sensor on an exposed pipe segment and the uh, radio transmitter unit along with a solar panel is set up in that uh, station uh, uh, set up uh, in front of the pipeline. Within the box, uh, the RTU is housed uh, together with a battery and that can provide uh, a year or two years of uh, battery life for the operation of the sensor. So with our solution implemented, what outcomes did we achieve? Uh, with our client, we have been identifying leaks at a rate of about two per week. H hundreds of leaks have since been found and repaired since the start of the program, generating significant savings for our client. Pressure transient data has also helped the utility better optimize their pumping schedules and changeovers to reduce the likelihood of pipeline damage across the network. And their asset lifespans have therefore been prolonged. We have received a testimony from our, this uh, client that we have. Uh, and that is indicated below. So with this outcomes that we've achieved, I mean, this is just one of the agent case studies that uh, I'd like to share today. Uh, we of course have a number of other clients across uh, uh, the APEC region uh, as well, uh, some in Australia, uh, some of those that uh, were highlighted earlier uh, by uh, Gary in his presentation uh, are also our clients. Uh, we, uh, provide a, a holistic solution for our clients to help them achieve outcomes in leak detection and pressure transient monitoring. So with that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much for being with me today. Uh, do let me know if you have any questions later on. Thank you, Ashley, for the interesting case study for location, more than 10 times as big as Singapore. Our third speaker, Mark Nicol, will be sharing with us his experience in Singapore, which is very much smaller than, your, than Ashley's kind just now spoken of. Mark has been with Mill Water Products Singapore for more than 10 years and is currently International Sales Director of the company. Mill Water Products manufactures specialist products used in water transmission distribution and measurement. Mark has a master's degree in water modeling and management. Mark, please let, let us know how you would collect data for decision-making in network management, please. 
Thank you very much for that introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank uh, ADB and PUB and the Singapore Water Association for inviting me today to share with you. Uh, I'm going to talk about using data and artificial intelligence to help us make better decisions on our water distribution networks. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm from uh, Mueller Water Products. We're a North American manufacturer of products and technologies in the water sector. Uh, and I'm responsible for our technology sales in the Asia Pacific region. So I will just move to my next slide. So this is really the big challenge that we're trying to face. And Ashley talked about this with a, a client in Malaysia. This is actually a problem around the world. Uh, this particular uh, burst happened in uh, San Francisco, in uh, Los Angeles, sorry, about five years ago. And it was a, a large critical pipe that failed. Um, and that pipe had been leaking for a number of years prior to failure. And uh, the reason that this happens is because we have an aging infrastructure. We have transients and pressures and flows acting on the network all the time. And these pipes are slowly degrading and failing. The challenge we have is how do we know what's going on? because ultimately we have lots of knowledge within a water treatment plant of what's happening in our processes and systems, but traditionally out in the network, we're kind of operating blind. I used to work for Thames Water in the UK, and this was a problem that I dealt with uh, many times when I'd be woken up uh, for a, a burst happening or a major leak event had happened. And we were starting to get flow and pressure data back then, but really we still took time to narrow down. And what we couldn't do was predict this from happening. So I'm going to share with you today a bit of a story that Mueller's on, a mission that Mueller's on, to help utilities predict these failures before they happen and help us optimize our networks into the future. Now, Mueller's really a manufacturer of products in the industry. That's what we're most famous for. We've been around 165 years, and we make fire hydrants, valves, gate valves, water meters, pressure control valves, uh, companies you may have heard of, such as Singer, or Pratt butterfly valves are Mueller, Mueller products. Um, Mueller's vision is to make these products intelligent and enable us to take data from the network, bring that back into a centralized system where we can start to make more informed decisions. Uh, for example, we have smart fire hydrants that can monitor flows, pressures, acoustics to identify where there's been a pressure change on the network or where there might be some acoustic indication of a leakage uh, in order to um, predict where that failure may be happening before it becomes a major burst, or the condition of our PRV to remotely monitor the condition of a PRV and determine when it needs maintenance before that maintenance happens. And Mueller's bringing this all together through a centralized digital services platform with which we can monitor, operate, and optimize these water distribution networks. There are many modules to this system. It goes by the brand name of Centrix Water Intelligence Platform. And I'm going to talk particularly today about leak detection and asset capital planning on water networks, as that's the topic that we're talking about today. But ultimately, it can help give you more informed decisions and insights into your network by not only taking this data from the network, but by applying artificial intelligence, machine learning, general standard analytics to the data in this format to make much more informed decisions. If we look at it from non-revenue water, Gary mentioned this before, the four pillars of, uh, of addressing real losses. You have pressure management, leak, leak monitoring and pipeline monitoring, asset management and speed and quality of repair. And you can take all these data sources to ultimately minimize your water loss, optimize your repair times, extend asset life and reduce your carbon footprint, uh, helping the world achieve net zero as everyone's trying to achieve. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is distribution and trunk main leak monitoring. Get a little bit on this from Ashley just now, so I try not to repeat what he's just said. Um, but ultimately, we're trying to identify and locate leaks as they form on the network. Um, leak monitoring is something that's really come along in the last few years. Uh, Gary mentioned the UK, uh, particularly United Utilities have a lot of uh, data acoustic bloggers out there. Uh, this is something that's really moving as technologies is improving, as technologies are developing. We have longer battery lives, we have better communication platforms, we have greater processing power, AI, machine learning, etc. But ultimately, this helps us manage our networks better. These networks are underground, they're out of sight, we don't know what's happening. Um, and by monitoring these networks, we can identify leaks as they form on the network. 
We don't have to spend millions and millions of dollars establishing zones and DMAs and meters, although they're still uh, beneficial, and I'm not suggesting we don't do that. Uh, there are alternative methods now that may complement and supplement that. Um, but ultimately, it helps us find leaks faster. We don't and, and avoid those big bursts. We don't lose as much water, and we don't have these catastrophic events, these failures that cause huge disruption to society, uh, huge interruptions to operational practices, uh, and make our lives much more difficult. So I'm going to talk about permanently installed acoustic sensors. There are a number on the market. Mueller has a product called EchoShore DX and a more, most recent product called EchoShore DXE. Uh, some of the things I said that have happened. So, for example, we can get, now get 10-year battery lives out of these products. That's a very long time, actually longer than probably the design life of a, an electronic product. In most cases, most mobile phones, you would only keep them maybe for two, three, four years. Uh, so it, it's a very long battery life, and this is enabling us to do full correlation on networks every single day, identifying leaks as they form. Uh, we're taking advantage of multiple communication platforms. 4G is obviously widespread around the world, but MBIOT and CAT, CAT M1 or LTEM cellular networks are available or being rolled out uh, quite extensively around the world right now, perhaps a little bit behind in, in Southeast Asia um, and South Asia, but they're still coming. Um, and, uh, and Mueller has a number of mechanical designs. We've integrated, I mentioned earlier, into a fire hydrant. We have a smart hydrant in North America. There's also a, a partner of ours in France, uh, Bayard, has a smart hydrant that this system's integrated into. So that's the hardware. Then we have this problem, which is the noise, uh, and literal noise here, because we're using acoustics, is that we're listening to the network. And if you go into a, a busy city in, in, in the world, and particularly in Asia, we have some very busy cities, you get a lot of noise. Uh, this specific data here is from 10,000 devices. Uh, these are deployed in North America, uh, not in one city, across multiple cities. And from 10,000 devices, we get over 25,000 events detected a year. But those 25,000 events, that's just data. That, that's not something that is very meaningful. You can't go and investigate all of these. So we can convert this data into information. Uh, even then, it's still not that useful. Information is... 10,000 events in this time, in, the, in this case, um, per year. What we really need are insights. We really need to know where are the leaks? Where do we need to send a team of people to go and repair a leak? Specifically within a few meters, we wanna know where to send the team. And that's really where the focus has come in order for us to improve these systems because we are gonna pull information, but what we're interested in are leak noises. And leak noises come in many, many forms. Um, rain, weather, wind makes noise, the traffic is the common one that everybody thinks about, makes noise, uh, pumps on your network moving water about, construction in the streets, many, many things make noise. But ultimately what we're looking for are leaks. And the, we do this uh, in Mueller through two main techniques. One is correlation. So correlation uh, removes ambient noise. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the science of correlation today. If you're interested, drop me a message, I can share more. Um, and we also do machine learning. We use something called a GPT, GBT classifier. Uh, and this helps us understand which noises are leaks. We do special uh, grouping of noises as well, because we will hear lots of noises, but only one of them might be the leak. So uh, we've applied all this analytics in order to perform better on our systems. Uh, the, the performance in North America on the system, really there's two key metrics that utilities are generally interested in, uh, and we as operators on networks, we want to make sure we've got high sensitivity. But what we mean by that is we want to make sure that uh, we find all the leaks. Right? There's no point in having a system that only finds 10% of the leaks. Although 10% is better than nothing, uh, you want to find all the leaks on your system. And, and you can see we're performing at almost 100% on that metric. Um, and then you've got precision. This is how, how many of the alerts are converted into actual leaks. And we're running at 78%. This is where that analytics, the AI performance comes in. So you can see uh, almost every leak on the network is being located. Uh, within a couple of meters, and of every four alerts that are sent, at least three of them are converting into confirmed leaks within a few meters of the location of that alert. Um, we also do uh, trunk main leak detection. Um, this is something that Ashley was talking about, trunk mains in a Malaysian uh, utility. I think I can guess which one it was because we work with the same utility. Um, and they actually use our equipment to follow up on some of the alerts. Uh, this shows how different technologies complement each other and you need to build the right tools for the toolbox. 
Um, in this case, we're putting sensors temporarily on the pipe. Uh, and you can see that this particular client that I've talked about here, we do have permission to share their name, uh, has saved over 40 million litres a day on their trunk main since 2017. That's not counting the 2022 data. I don't have this year's data, but they survey around uh, two to 3,000 kilometres a year of transmission pipes. So that's the N300 and above. Uh, and you can see over 500 leaks have been located on the network. Uh, we also have a permanent installation version of this, so permanently monitoring trunk mains. Uh, in this case, uh, we have a large installation of Singapore PUV. Uh, they started with a pilot. Everybody starts with pilots. There's the joke, there's more pilots in the water industry than in the, the uh, airline industry. Uh, but everybody wants to do a pilot, and we started with a pilot. Uh, we then went to a 100-kilometer scale-up, uh, and, and now we're on a 300-node five-year project at the moment, covering around 200 kilometers. Uh, we've detected many leaks forming on the network. Everybody says PUV have very low leakage. It's true, but still leaks happen, even where people... Uh, don't think that they have leaks, there will still be leaks. Every, every network is going to leak at some point. And these are critical pipes. Uh, you can see here an example of what's been located. So June the 18th, uh, no, no indication of a leak. This is a correlation graph uh, here, no indication of a leak. We've got a peak on the right here, which is what we call an out of bracket noise. So that's a noise further down the network. We know what that is. The next day we start to see a peak forming. Uh, so we alert PUB, they go to site, excavate, and they found a very small leak uh, within, actually this particular case was within less than one meter accuracy at the location we said, uh, on a critical pipe next to an expressway uh, in Singapore. That's just an example of, of what can be achieved with these technologies now that wasn't available 20 years ago when I started, certainly. Now, the next bit that I just want to finish off on, uh, I've got about three minutes left, is long-term asset planning. And this is really what I believe is one of the challenges. Gary mentioned it. Uh, Australia does less leak detection because they do more pipe replacement, they do more asset management. And ultimately, at some point, point in time, pipes are going to fail uh, and they're going to need to be replaced. The problem is we don't know when. They do not deteriorate at the exact same rate in the same way as we as humans don't all deteriorate at the same rate. Um, and different things go wrong with different uh, pipes at different times. So basing purely on age or previous breaks is not an efficient way of doing this. So we really need to understand the condition. Uh, in the medical industry, we do this through going to the doctors and having medical checkups, and they might run tests or do scans. Uh, in the water industry, for distribution pipes, there hasn't really been much of a, a way to do this. So people replace based on age. Uh, and this is an example from Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission in North America in the US, where you can see the age of pipes and the break rates over time. There really is a poor correlation. In fact, it's, it's 1%. There, there is no correlation between leaks happening and age of pipe. Just because something's old doesn't mean it's going to leak. Uh, however, as pipe degrades, and this is based on an integrity rating, which comes from a, a non-invasive condition assessment technique called EPulse, uh, you can see there is a clear correlation, in fact, a nearly 90% correlation. So if we can understand the condition, the integrity rating of our pipes, we can better predict where those leaks are going to be in the future and therefore which pipes we need to replace and how much we need to replace. Because what we do know is that there's way more pipe in the ground than there is budget available to replace those assets. Um, the technique that Mueller uh, ha has acquired actually from a company called Ecologics, uh, Mueller acquired Ecologics uh, 10 years ago is called ePulse. And this is a patented non-invasive uh, uh, acoustic technique where acoustic sensors are connected to fittings on the pipe. There's no excavation needed. You connect to existing fittings and you make a noise. And we are measuring the condition of this section of pipe between two sensors. Uh, and we can determine the uh, structural wall condition, the average wall thickness of the pipe over this section, uh, and use this to start to predict remaining service life, uh, integrity rating, uh, and, and prioritize pipe replacement. A huge advantage because we're using sound, and I just talked about acoustics for leak detection, this does leak detection at the same time. So how would you do this survey? If you imagine you've got a network here of, of, of pipes, uh, with fittings, valves, and hydrants, we connect a sensor at one fitting, we connect a sensor at a second fitting, we make a noise on the pipe, and we are measuring this particular segment of pipe. You then move one of the sensors to a different fitting, you tap outside of bracket, as we call it, on the pipe, and now you're measuring this section. 
And you can run through a network and cover around a kilometer in a day of your network with this technique, completely non-invasive, non-destructive on your pipe. And you come up with a GIS layer that tells you the condition of your pipe, uh, compare it to the original, and we can see here which is bad, which is good, which is moderate pipe on your network. Red being bad, green being good, uh, if that wasn't too obvious. So another example of this is, is here in Singapore, where PUB Singapore have adopted this technique, and we, we worked looking at the aging cast iron pipes in Singapore. Singapore identified they had higher break rates than the rest of their network. They were the particular problem for, for PUB on their water distribution network. Uh, and so they engaged us to help prioritize the, those pipe replacements. And, and there's around 450 kilometers that PUB wanted to replace over a period of around uh, 10 years. And they asked us to come in and say, which order do we replace them in? Which pipes do we do in year one, which at the time was 2020? Uh, and which do we do in year 10, which was 2029? Uh, in order to do this, we didn't test every single pipe. Um, there was a limited budget. So we engaged Suez as our subcontractor uh, to provide an artificial intelligence desktop analysis. Uh, they had software called NetScan. I think they now call it Asset Advanced. Um, but it's a tool that basically takes existing data and they apply AI on that data to predict pipe failures. Um, they then calibrate that data with condition assessment data. And in this case, we were calibrating with uh, Ecologics ePulse data. So we surveyed around 20% of the network. It was 80 kilometers uh, of the network and then used that data to fully calibrate the model and come up with a prioritization model for the system. Uh, as I mentioned, the intent was to replace all of that pipe. Um, but actually 35% of it didn't need to be replaced. So although it was the material uh, that PUB was struggling the most with, 35% of it, over a third of it, actually there's nothing wrong with it. Um, it has at least 10 years of life, and I'm not going to go into the details of how long, but a very long time left for that pipe. Um, so it's old, um, but it doesn't mean it needs replacing. So one third can be saved. Their savings from this is an, uh, an estimated 70 million Singapore dollars, um, about 55 million US dollars by not replacing pipe that they originally planned to replace. So you can see that by taking this data, it's possible to start to make more informed decisions on which pipes to replace. Um, uh, I think that's all I have time for today. I just finished by sharing my email. I think we have a Q&A coming up later. So uh, I just want to say uh, thank you very much again, and I look forward to answering any questions later. Thank you, Mark. You spent quite a bit of time talking about using acoustics to detect leaks. Our fourth speaker happens to be an acoustic expert, Dr. Rajat Misha. Rajat, you obtained your PhD from NUS, the National University of Singapore, and is a postdoctoral fellow in Acoustic Research Laboratory of NUS. Uh, Rajat is co-founder of Torado Analytic, which is a spin-off of Man US. Let's hear from him how to use a range of products, including acoustic ones, for leak detection and condition assessment. Rajat, please. Oh, thank you. Uh... Uh, so I am Rajit. Uh, we are from the Analytics, and as I pointed, that we are a spin-off from National Institute of Singapore. So first, before I start about the journey, I will briefly cover about who are we. So me and my co-founder Liangji, we are from uh, Acoustic Research Lab uh, from NUS. We are actually a spin-off uh, from uh, NUS Grip program, which is just focused on getting. Uh, funds to the graduate uh, graduates from this uh, university. And we also have an esteemed network of advisors, uh, both uh, our professors, as well as uh, from Ripple to Wave Incubator, which is a Singapore incubator for, for water tech. Uh, basically, we have uh, three products that we offer. One is the uh, Terido ROV. This is a vehicle that goes inside the pipelines and can inspect both visually as well as acoustically about the pipe condition and alert about both uh, things like a cement line falling off or you can, can even alert about if there's any kind of leak that is happening. Uh, and we generate this and tell this and all this in real time. Uh, 
Uh, we also have our listeners, which is the pipeline listener as well as the machinery listener. Now, the pipeline listener is basically a device that sits on the uh, pipelines continuously, and it basically listens for uh, any kind of anomaly 24-7. We also have a machine listener. These are sensors that are typically installed in uh, plants where you uh, you would basically hear uh, for me mechanized or motorized uh, equipments are in this in that particular room. Uh, for the discussion today, uh, we are mainly focusing of our on our work with the pipeline listener with PUB, uh, which is this particular product. And I think most of it is pretty much covered. But why I think automated part is required is that I think we want to uh, prevent situ uh, situations where there is an increased uh, non remaining water. That is, I think, one core point. And the second core point that sometimes people often miss is that such kind of leaks, which can happen uh, all across the city, they do harm the reputation of your building board. It does affect them uh, uh, even reputation-wise as well. And therefore, we wanted to develop uh, solutions that could uh, address these two problems. So first of all, we started back in 2019. Uh, so we are a really a uh, new uh, company. So we started off with uh, in 2019, where we installed our sensors uh, around eight sites in Singapore. And uh, what you see over here is that during this particular pilot that we did, we were able to already start detecting leaks in the very first install uh, installation that we did. Uh, what you see on the top right corner is like the typical uh, uh, typical uh, sensor footprint you will have. Uh, and what you see at the bottom, uh, just below is uh, the acoustic signature from that particular installment. So what you see is pretty silent uh, in a scenario where it is just one line that is telling you that there is a leak. And the reason I, I picked up this particular case is because this leak was actually not because of the pipe. It was actually the, the valve, the butterfly valve had had a very small leak in it, which was letting the water uh, go by. And this is an interesting point because it was not the pipe that was leaving. It, in fact, the water was not even coming out of the pipeline, but it was this butterfly valve that was not shutting off completely. And we were able to detect this kind of leak in the very first installment that we did. The second type of uh, interesting findings that we have uh, are I mean, we have been hearing throughout this particular uh, conversation is about uh, how acoustics is hard to, uh, and acoustics uh, it could be uh, very difficult to uh, remove from all the noise, as Nic uh, Nicole was pointing out and even I was pointing out. So uh, what we ha I have over here is just to show some of those types of noise, uh, the type of noise that you would see from the sensors coming out. So what you see over here is, uh, so what do you hear? So what you hear heard just now was actually somebody piling doing piling work around and basically because of this pipe, this pipe is able to carry that noise and therefore sensors pick up this noise and think that it is a leak. Now the reason sensors think about if this as a leak is because most of the leak detection technologies that are out there, they are looking for a kind of an average average value over their entire recording. Let's say in this case, they have recorded for 10 seconds. They would say that average noise is this much and which is higher than the one before and therefore they would alert for leaks. And this is what we have seen is one of the reasons of the false positives, uh, high false positives coming out of the census. And if, for example, this one case uh, that is there, I am I'm sure that you won't be able to even hear it, but what you can see from the images is that the first one and the last one are pretty identical when you hear it. You don't really hear much of the noise in it. It is, and the way they are different is the first one is actually an MRT passing by the where the pipeline infrastructure is, and the third one is actual leak. So it is very hard, indeed, it is true, it's very hard to differentiate uh, between the, all the acoustics that are being produced by, around the pipeline infrastructure. And so what this really led us to develop is 
we wanted to figure out a way to develop this event trigger mechanism because generally the sensors that are out there, they are waking up at a fixed cycle to save on battery and they would be waking up every 24 hours to basically listen. And if there is a leak, they will tell that, oh yeah, there is a leak. Uh, and basically in between that time, so let's say from today and between tomorrow, if there's a leak, we don't, uh, we are not able to monitor it. It's only when they wake up at that particular time, that's when they hear and they can tell about their sleep. So there is this, there isn't any continuous form of monitoring that is happening on those sense, on those Python network. We also, as we just explained that there is this high false positive alarm rate uh, that happens all across uh, sensors. And what we wanted to develop is uh, a leak detection device that basically activates on certain frequency signatures. So what the unique feature about this particular product is that it isn't transmitting or it isn't uh, alerting or uploading data continuously. This particular sensor does some sort of an onboard processing and it tries to understand whether this noise is an actual leak or not. And it does this continuously. So there is no sleeping period. It, it, the might, your pipeline, your entire network gets monitored 24 over seven. You just install it once and it stays there and it monitors for you forever. It also has this multifold decision layer on the right side, uh, on which is the which is sits in the cloud. So basically, whenever these sensors do wake up and they do think that there is a leak, it transmits the data to the cloud, and this cloud then picks up and then further uh, runs an ML algorithm that looks at all these spectrums and understands that actually this is indeed a leak, and we should alert the authorities. So there is a lot of uh, decision that goes into this particular framework. Uh, before alerting the users about any kind of leak. And with this, we started our uh, deployment. Uh, and then in this deployment, we installed a sensors uh, across uh, multiple regions in, in Singapore. Uh, and as you can see that uh, over here with the two installations, we, the, which are marked by the green dots, whereas there were similarly leaks uh, at the gray dots. And we were able to uh, identify and even like tell that there are leaks uh, in this region. In fact, uh, during this deployment, there was an actual leak that was existing in this in pipeline infrastructure. And because of these event triggered uh, sensors, uh, we were able to alert uh, and go far beyond our, our initial planned uh, similar leaks. So we were able to even find an actual leak and alert the authorities that this leak currently exists and somebody has to uh, take an action on it. The good thing was that uh, this is where we also help with uh, with the repetition part because it was in, in an industrial area and we were able to alert uh, the authorities in time so that this could be fixed. And what you see on the on the right uh, bottommost uh, image is where the leak was actually fixed and uh, the, the image is after that. Uh, in addition to that, we are not only able to do event-based, but we are also able to do large distances. So for example, in this case, the leak uh, sensor, uh, our sensor was installed about 120 meters away, I'm sorry, 160 meters away, and we were able to detect these leaks quite easily as well. And uh, what you see on the right is actually uh, there was this event that was happening and basically construction work that was happening right next to one of the sensors. And this construction work was producing very similar signatures to, to leaks, which is these uh, long dash lines. And we were able to uh, we were able to detect that these are false positive and not alert the authorities. And later on, this was even confirmed that it was not exactly a leak, but it was indeed the construction work that was causing this noise. So what is next for us? Uh, we are actually exploring to deploy beyond Singapore now. We are already in that phase. We are actively looking to in, for partners as well investors in the uh, uh, ASEAN region. And the reason we are looking for this particular region is because we can definitely provide uh, a good customer support, uh, tech support as well, both as uh, business support. And uh, we think that because of that, we would be able to even build trust with trusted customers. And in case any of you are interested, we are just one email away. Uh, we will be happy to discuss if there is any questions about it. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Your event triggered approach to detecting this is indeed uh, very interesting. And I wish your company a success business in Singapore and beyond. Oh, so you. now, very quickly, we come to our Q&A section. 
uh, would the audience please post your questions in the chat box while we wait for more questions to come in. Uh, okay, already some questions have come in. Um, quite a number of people ask about before and after. For example, Gary, in your, uh, in your presentation, you mentioned about Utility Waters SLMP, the 10-year plan. Some people would like to know where it is now and whether Utility water achieved the 35 reduction that they have expect, uh, that, that they expect to achieve. And for Ashley, for your Malaysian case study, uh, is there any way, let me see what's the question, from 33.3% of leakage, uh, do you know what is the, what is the level now has reduced to? Maybe Gary first, then Ashley, please. Yes, so uh, Unity Water developed their uh, SLMP. Um, actually, it was about this time last year. So it was um, September in uh, 2021. So they've only been um, starting to develop the pro or implement the program for about one year now. So it's still a bit too early to tell um, how the performance is, is going. So they've still got nine more years to go. Ashley? Okay, so I can share that for our Malaysian client, they've uh, achieved a reduction of some uh, four to five percent, uh, achieving about 28.6 percent uh, non revenue water in 2020. Uh, and they are on track to achieve their longer term targets to achieve 25 percent by uh, 2025. Thank you. There are also some questions coming in. I believe that it it, it means that uh, for some utilities, they may be having their own network, which they have no information. Okay, if they don't have network maps, they don't even know where the pipes are. In such cases, would your technology or would your, would your approach be able to detect the, the leaks? And if you, if you know that there's a leak, how do you locate those missing pipes? I don't know which, uh, which speaker should I direct to. Maybe if any of you can answer this question, please chip in to help. I can help answer that. If It's quite common, in uh, particularly in Asia, that people don't know uh, what assets they have underground. Um, and that's a challenge, obviously. The, the first challenge is if you don't know what you've got, you're not going to be able to find the problems with it. Um, and we come across this all the time. Now, the first thing is, uh, my advice is to, to try and start recording whatever you have. I'm absolutely certain that there will be some information. You may not have a GIS, you may not have a, a good indication, but you'll have some information um, and use best judgment uh, to come up with that. Um, it's possible to install any of our equipment on networks where we don't know the, uh, the, the material, the diameter, and therefore the distance, like where the fittings are, the distance, it just makes it much more difficult for the systems to work. I think, uh, I don't want to speak for everyone else, but I'm pretty sure everyone else is going to require knowledge of the pipes uh, that are underground. But what we've identified is from our side, when we're doing condition assessment, we can start to assess what the material or the diameter might be. The problem is we need to know one or the other because sound travels in a pipe at certain speeds depending on material diameter and pressure so if we know the diameter but we don't know the material we can make an assumption and say actually we don't think this is a cast iron pipe we think it's ductile or we think it's steel or plastic or whatever but if you've got absolutely nothing it's going to be very difficult so the first thing is to go and try and capture any data you have on your network my experience, I've been in Asia for 15 years. Most people have some information. Um, uh, if you've got absolutely nothing, then there's probably not a lot we can do apart from help you, you get it. But if you've got something, generally, most solutions, we can start to work out what's going on. But, but for the systems to work op operably, optimally, sorry, such as Ashley, Rajat, and myself have shared, I think you probably need good info. It's bad data in is bad results out, basically. I don't know if Ashley or Rajat... Oliang, do you have anything to add? 
Yeah, I actually want to echo uh, Mark's points. Uh, really, data is quite important. But at the very least, at the baseline, I would say that uh, the pipe GIS is actually quite important. Uh, I mean, making sense of the acoustic signals or the pressure signals in our case that are coming in is one is one thing, uh, which of course the diameter of the pipe and the material, all these are, are important. And we can see how we can work our way around those assumptions. But really, if you can't even uh, know which sensors to relate to each other because you just don't have that uh, uh, pipe network diagram, then uh, that would be a bit difficult, I would think. And <laughs> I don't think anybody has a magic sauce for that, unfortunately. So uh, what we do know, of course, is that uh, uh, there are ways to kind of uh, verify the rough idea that we might have of where the pipes are running. Uh, we could use a, a variety of technologies, for example, um, uh, one way is using electromagnetic signatures, for example, to kind of walk the pipelines, right? Uh, I Unfortunately, not really within uh, uh, at least the, amb the ambit of the solution that Xylem provides, <laughs> but I'm sure there are people out there who, who, who take on some of these uh, 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 jobs to try and figure out what exactly is hiding underneath the ground. Thank you, Mark and Ashley. Ashley, actually, there's another question to you, or maybe even to other speakers. You mentioned about the Malaysian utilities provider. They reduced the NRW from 33% to 28%. So there appears to be a method to quantify the NRW. Do you think you can elaborate slightly more about how to quantify? Because I think baseline is important. You know where you are. And then to measure your success or your achievement, what, what reduction you have achieved is also impo uh, important. So please talk about how you quantify another view, please. Sure. Actually, just to point out, I think Gary had a very informative presentation on uh, quantifying NRW earlier. Uh, I think if we all recall, uh, IWA has a standard table, right, uh, which Gary uh, showed as part of his presentation. Uh, there are a number of sources that contribute to uh, NRW, uh, including your authorized uh, unbuilt consumption, right, and your uh, meter losses and so on. I mean, I'm just listing it off the top of my head, but there are a number of components that contribute to NRW. So leakages are one of those components. Uh, and basically the solutions that we've been expounding on today uh, really are focusing on this component where we're talking about detecting leakages quickly, identifying them before they become worse, before they become massive, right? And rectifying them, allowing the, the our customers to rectify them early such that they can reduce the net amount of water that's actually going out through this leakage, right? So that's actually the essence of what we are after to, uh, with regards to the technologies that we've shared. Um, to do the baselining is a matter of filling in that table, uh, figuring out how to do those estimates. We had not provided that advice to this Malaysian utility. I'm sure they have their, all utilities have their own means, right? I mean, uh, uh, Gary did share that in terms of baselining, for example, in the, in the UK, uh, the utilities are not allowed to use the, uh, standard, uh, estimates, right? They are provided by the IWA, right? Uh, so they have to actually go and figure out how to quantify it themselves. So maybe they do it by means of meters, maybe they do it by means of hydraulic modeling, but they, they, they do some way to kind of identify uh, those components that uh, Gary was mentioning where losses to, to, to uh, theft, illegal tap-offs, losses due to meter inaccuracies and so on, right? So those, those all contribute to a baselining. And, and once they have their baselining, then they can try and estimate what's their non reading water now. Uh, and then after the implementation of these solutions that we, uh, I mean, the group of us here are all uh, expounding on, then they can do a baselining again, right? To see how they've uh, then improved on their system. Yeah. So, so Gary, I think that's my first one. Gary, anything to add over here? No, I, th I think what Ashley has said is um, correct. So non-revenue water is a pretty simple calculation. It's basically the total input volume into your system, which is meters at all of your treatment plants or your bulk meters into the system. 
minus the total volume of water that's sold to your customers. So a you sum up all of your customer meters over a certain period and you deduct that from the uh, the bulk meters. And that will give you a total non-revenue water for that uh, water utility. What the IWA water balance does is it breaks that total NRW down into a series of components. Uh, so it starts off with apparent losses and real losses, and then you can break it down even further into uh, theft, uh, unmetered, uh, par- uh, metering errors, and then you can break the real losses down into transmission losses, distribution losses, uh, service pipe losses. So um, the initial calculation is quite simple, but then breaking it down gives the utility a bit more idea of where their highest um, losses are. Is it is it mainly apparent losses? Is it mainly metering errors? Or is it mainly leakage in your distribution? And then you can concentrate the uh, where you start to do your activities in to reduce non-revenue water. Thank you, Kerry. The next question is not technical, but it's more like commercial or, or contractual. Uh, I think more, more for Ashley and Mark to reply. Is that what, how are you remunerated for your effort by the, by the utilities? Okay, because I, we have heard of uh, on a success basis, after you achieve, for example, in the Malaysian state thing, after you achieve 25, for example, was there ever additional, additional reduction that you can achieve for them would be, a, would be some kind of bonus payment or, or what? So maybe we, we would like to know more about your experience or different forms of uh, remuneration for your effort. Maybe Mark first and Ashley, if you don't mind. No, I and, this, and the answer I think would be, interest, would be of interest to Rajat. Yeah, I'm sure Rajat is going to want cash up front to uh, to fund his uh, future development um, as a startup. I'm sure cash flow is tight, um, as, as it is with utilities. I think here's the big, it's a very good question, actually. Um, we are standard business model. Um, and I think Zyland talk the same as people pay us to buy our product. Uh, number of sensors, they pay a rate per sensor to install. Um, and then they will pay us a monitoring fee, a management fee to manage that network because these systems are bringing data back and we're running analysis. It could be that the business model is a pure CapEx model where uh, the utility invests upfront in the entire thing, or it could be a complete OPEX project where the utility doesn't buy any of the assets and they just pay us for a service. So we have that uh, uh, with one of the clients I talked about today, uh, where actually we own all of the assets. We, we do everything for them. We've designed the system. We manufacture the system. We install the system. We maintain it. And we do all of the ongoing monitoring of the system. Uh, the, the way that works is um, they pay us if the system works, basically. So if we send them alerts, they pay us. Um, it's not paid based on performance because we don't know if a leak's going to form. So if a leak doesn't form, we won't get paid. So we're just paid on is our system operational and giving data that the utility can use. So that is passing some of the performance to us in the form of they only pay us if the system works. If the system doesn't collect data or the data is not usable, they won't pay us. Um, and we have to cover if, the, if one of the sensors breaks, we have to cover the maintenance. So that's built into that. And we, we call it an operational model. Um, and a lot of drive and change in the industry is in this direction we're seeing. And, and, and I think the term is either software as a service or data as a service. In this case, it's really data because we're giving data. We're not just giving them software, we're giving them data. Um, and actually, the um, Water Services Association of Australia, jointly with the Swan Forum, is implementing the DAS project right now to investigate DAS, D-A-S-S, a D-A-A-S as a service. And I'm part of that working committee on, on DAS. Um, from a performance-based contract, which is if we reduce leakage down to a certain number, we get paid. I've personally been involved in those projects, um, as I know has Gary, um, when we worked for consultants. But 
that's really looking holistically at a whole NRW program. You would have to have a very clear knowledge of your baseline, very clear targets. What we're doing is just one piece of the picture, the detecting of leaks. Um, in order to achieve that leakage saving, you also have to go and fix the leaks and repair them in a timely manner. You have to do other things as well, such as pressure management is a huge thing. Um, so that's often one of the, the, the quickest ways actually to reduce your NOW is to reduce your pressures. The lower the pressure, the less the leakage. So if you were looking at a performance-based contract in terms of achieving a goal, it tends to be a more holistic solution of which our solutions may be part of. And uh, um, I know the Malaysian client that, that Ashley's talked about uh, used to outsource its NRW to a performance-based contract and used that, that company used Mueller and Xylem products as part of their contract, but they still just, well, in our case, they just paid us. I think I'll pass the mic to Ashley. I think you're probably similar, but interesting to know if Xylem differs from that. Thanks, Mark. Actually, uh, you've covered it pretty well. Uh, it's pretty much the standard uh, kind of offerings that uh, for us as solution providers uh, charge is mainly on the operational model that, that uh, Mark has mentioned, right? Where there's an upfront cost uh, for the system setup, uh, there's a cost per sensor, right? And uh, subsequently there's a ongoing maintenance cost where uh, customers pay as they get the actionable data that they can utilize, right? Uh, I, I do know that in the region, there has been a push for performance-based contracting, as Mark has mentioned. But uh, likewise, I echo Mark's sentiments in this case that uh, it's a very holistic kind of program that needs to be done to reduce NRW. And uh, just to add on to what he said, it's not just on incumbent on the uh, consultant or the solutions provider right, uh, to be able to implement the necessary changes required to realize these outcomes. Many a time, the clients themselves, right, have to take a lot of active action to be able to realize the outcomes that, that they want. Uh, this includes, for example, as Mark said, putting in place uh, a pressure management program, which affects, which is mainly driven by their operations teams, right? The operations teams that are managing the supply network, that are managing the, the pumps at the treatment plants, for example, or, or how they configure their network even, right? To, to make sure that they can reduce pressure without compromising on their re resilience uh, requirements, right? Or their service standards. So all these are actually go come into play and the, the solutioning is actually quite holistic. And really, I think uh, a full on performance-based uh, uh, kind of contracting or charging for a solution provider in a small space for the whole NRW picture is highly unlikely at this point in time, I would say. Uh, at the end of the day, it, it needs to be a collaborative effort. Uh, and in, in my personal opinion, uh, given the fact that the, the outcomes uh, are also heavily dependent on the uh, client as well, I believe that clients do need also to have some skin in the game uh, to make sure that uh, you know their, their teams, their ground teams are, are, are really giving their all to, to make sure that the outcomes of uh, NRW reduction are realized. So that's, that's my opinion on this. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mark and uh, Ashley. Gary, there's another question to you. On your slide 18, you appear to show that some utilities have spent quite a fair bit of high investment into network management, and yet the NRW remains high. Are there any lessons learned from such uh, cases, please? Yeah, I think um, Mark mentioned this before as well. It's uh, basically a balance between and um, what we've seen, like the UK water utilities and the Australian utilities. Um, you can spend money on asset management or you can spend money on leak repair, leak detection. Um, Sorry, Gary, it your connection seems, is... It's in some senses... You, Gary, the, your, your, your connection is not very good. That are spending asset replacement. Uh, yep. Me? Can, can you hear me now? 
now. Hello, can you hear me now? Now it appears to be okay. Yeah, please go on. Yeah, so it's it's a bit of a, a balance between how much do you spend on asset replacement and how much do you spend on doing asset maintenance. Uh, the Australian utilities seem to have gone the asset replacement way, uh, which uh, in some sense is good because they have Sorry, Gary, um, we, we really can't uh, hear you very well. Maybe we, oh, we wait, wait for your Wi-Fi to recover a little bit first. Sorry, I was okay. talking to myself, yeah. That, that there's a big question over here. What is the lowest possible NRW that a utility can possibly achieve? So it's a quite a textbook type of questions. Anybody wants to maybe maybe, maybe everybody takes a take turn to answer this question? I, I can answer that first of all. In theory, it's zero, but in reality, that's never going to happen. Um, you're never going to have a fully perfect network that doesn't leak, that doesn't have uh, any inaccuracies on metering. Like the first thing to remember is all meters have an inherent error in them. Nothing's 100% accurate. So even if you had a, the most accurate input meter and the most accurate output meter and you only had two meters, then you're probably going to get them to balance. But otherwise, you're going to have a, a discrepancy. So uh, even on the recording, the measurement, it's unlikely you'll ever get to zero. Um, and then there's going to be some leaks. Like you can go and fix leaks and new ones will form. Now with technologies and with the way things are going, in theory, you can get to um, background leakage. Background leakage by definition is leakage that cannot be found by existing technologies. And as new technologies come to market, um, they're going to drive background leakage down. The, the sort of things that Torito, Xylem, Mueller, et cetera, are doing is helping reduce that, that background leakage so that we can get closer to zero. Um, the UK has a target of zero leakage by 2050. It's a target that's been set because it drives innovation. It's a target that, yeah, it would be great to achieve it, but realistically, no, no one will achieve it. I think the key target to try and achieve is what's the right target for each individual utility. And, and the benchmarking um, that the IELTS doing is great because it compares similar peers on what's achievable. Um, a small utility in... Uh, the Philippines, small uh, water district, is going to be very different, for example, to PUB, which is a, a national water company. Um, so comparing on a percentage, first of all, is, is misleading. So it's better to use other metrics, but ultimately it's about getting to the economic level, I think, or the environmental level. So economic is the point at which it's not cost effective to do any more leakage. The problem with using economic is... People don't pay very much for water, so you can be at 40% and still that's your economic level because it's not economically viable to keep reducing. So I think like an environmental leakage level, so as we're all trying to achieve net zero uh, as a planet to, to reduce carbon output, um, we should be looking to consider those types of things. So there's no way you could put a number to it for some places. If I use a percentage, it may be 5%, some may be 10 some may be 20 um, it's about the individual and trying to drive down leakage as much as is efficiently possible to save a finite resource that uh, that, that we all should should be trying to achieve. There's, there's not an unlimited supply of potable water. There is pretty much an unlimited supply of water, but we can't economically and environmentally treat that and get that water. So uh, that's a, a long answer to say, Potentially zero, but probably not zero. Yeah, but Mark, I may say that you use a very concise and nice language to describe the situation. Anybody want anything to add? Yeah, I'd like to add on to... to um, uh, Ash uh, yeah, actually, just to uh, uh, point out, I think, well, yes, I agree that zero percent is not something that is uh, attainable for sure. <laughs> it's an ideal state. Um, I would say that uh, the benchmarking exercise that Gary had uh, described uh, seems to be uh, a step towards trying to 
uh, allow us to do all this uh, best in class comparison. But just offhand from my own experience, uh, seeing the utilities uh, in all these uh, water conferences and uh, the similar size utilities to say PUV and how they perform, I would say that uh, a good utility achieves maybe 10% or less NRW. Uh, apart from just uh, leakages, which we can do our best to resolve, uh, there are also other means, for example, uh, reducing uh, water quality incidents, right? which require flushing, again, that's unbuilt, metered consum unbuilt unmetered consumption, which again contributes to NRW. Maybe not very significant if such incidents are far and few in between, but uh, if the water safety plan that utilities have is not robustly implemented and you keep needing to flush because somehow your plant keeps having <laughs> issues and it sends out bad water, then of course uh, it can end up contributing a significant amount. So I think all, all in, in a kind of holistic sense, uh, if, if, we, if we do address NRW holistically across the entire value chain of providing that water from source to the customer tap. I, I would say just off the top of my head, from what I've seen, I think below 10% would be a pretty good uh, 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 kind of benchmark for large municipal utilities. Of course, as Mark said, you know, if you're small and you're uh, uh, fairly easy to manage, I think you, you probably should set yourself better targets, I feel. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, there's a practical question again. Who or how the number of location of monitoring nooks uh, are decided? Uh, is it decided by the authority, uh, by the utilities, or suggested by by service providers like you? Uh, I can go first. So most suppliers of acoustic. I'm going to talk about permanent acoustic devices here. Uh, most suppliers of permanent acoustic devices will sell those products and give them to the client and they will choose where to put them and they'll put them on existing valves and fittings. Um, one of the differentiators we have is we developed a patented tool to optimize where to put acoustic sensors. So we would take, if it's available, the GIS data, obviously if GIS isn't available, the whole thing's difficult, but we would take that information and we run it through algorithms that can predict where to put the sensors. And we would work with the client on this in order to determine um, how they want the system to operate. And what, what I mean by that is, um, from, a, from an acoustics perspective, uh, the more sensors you put, the more sensitive your system will be. So if you put, I think Rajat mentioned they were finding leaks over about 130 meters. So if you put sensors 100 meters apart, across your whole network, then you would have a very densely, very efficient system. But that's going to also be costly because you're going to need a lot of sensors every 100 meters. So if budget is a constraint, maybe you put them every three, four, 500 meters um, apart. And, and sensor spacing depends on many factors, diameter, pressure, material being those. Um, so you can choose where to put the sensors. So from our perspective, we would recommend where to put the sensors. Um, to the utility based on our knowledge of acoustics on that pipe, because uh, the utilities are great and people who understand their networks, but they don't necessarily are acoustic experts. So we, we would personally propose where to put those sensors and design that system jointly with the client based on their requirements and their budget. Ashley, anything to add very quickly? Yeah, likewise, uh, similar to, to what Mark said, uh, generally it's uh, done by the solution provider to kind of analyze where to put these sensors. Uh, and then we work with the uh, client to basically identify how, how to go about doing that. Because sometimes when you identify certain locations, if they are not really exposed, excavation is required, additional cost is required, then we do need to open that discussion with the client. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Well, those questions are still pouring in, but Obviously, we're approaching five o'clock and we can handle all of them. Maybe just let me wrap up. I was remotely involved in the NRW uh, project in Southeast Asia 20 over years ago. And uh, although technically we have done well, but financially we didn't because of the setting the baseline, eventually defining what is the, what is the uh, eventual reduction was not very clearly Defined at that time. Okay. But I'm very glad to see the technologies has improved so much. 20 over years ago, when we talk about listeners, it's really a guy <laughs> listening to the to the pipe. Okay. And now, of course, we are helped by this, all this uh all these sensors. 
And I'm also glad to hear that there's a battery that is 10, you know, can last for 10 years. All these technologies and um, improvement, continuous improvement of this would definitely help us approaching closer and closer to this 0% and other bill. Thank you, everybody. Scary, sorry that we lost your voice. Uh, we, we must have we must have lost quite a fair bit of knowledge because you can't you can't share. Um, with that, uh, I thank all the speakers. I thank also the audience uh, participation. Thank you very much. Thank you.